everyone. I'm Sarah Halter. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Medical History Museum. Um, welcome to all of you both here in, in person and those of you joining us online. This is the 2023 annual George H. Rawls MD Memorial Lecture on the History of Minorities in Medicine. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to our donors and members who are present. Your support is critical to the work of the museum and we're very grateful for that support. Um, I'd also like to recognize and thank a couple of our board members who are here, Dr. Bob Pascuzzi, Lindsay Swindle, uh, David Zahner, I knew there was at least one more. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Anybody I missed? Okay. Um, and then I'd like to, to extend a very big thank you to the Rawls family for their continued encouragement and support of this work. So we're here today to honor the memory and celebrate the work of Dr. George H. Rawls, a man who truly was a pioneer for black surgeons in Indianapolis and who spent his entire career and his retirement advancing minority representation in the medical field. Dr. Rawls graduated as the valedictorian from Florida A&M University where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Biology. He uh, then attended Howard University Medical School where he earned his medical degree with Alpha Omega Alpha honors. He served in the US Army for two years. He uh, came back to uh, become a, uh, a resident, sorry, I've lost my place here, uh, a surgical resident at Ohio State University. And a, he did a surgical internship at Philadelphia General Hospital. In 1959, Dr. Rawls began his practice as a surgeon here in Indianapolis. And after a distinguished 34 year career, he was appointed assistant dean of student affairs and clinical professor of surgery at Ivy School of Medicine. Dr. Rawls helped launch the Master of Science in Medical Science program in 1995 to support students from underrepresented populations in medicine. And as of 2020, the MSMS pipeline program had graduated 469 students with over 300 of those matriculating into medical school. In 2001, uh, Indiana University awarded Dr. Rawls an honorary Doctor of Science degree to recognize his enduring efforts to increase representation of minorities in the medical profession. A devoted student of history, Dr. Rawls' most important contribution was perhaps his history of the Black physician in Indianapolis, 1870 to 2000. Dr. Rawls passed away in 2020, and later that year, the Indiana Medical History Museum established this annual lecture series to honor his memory and recognize his many important accomplishments, as well as to tell the story of medicine as it relates to minorities and underrepresented and underserved groups, whose stories and voices are frequently left out of histories and left out of the historical record. Our goal for this series is to highlight the vast and varied ways that minorities have, willingly or not, both participated in and experienced medicine. These rich and important stories have been too often overlooked or ignored, missing great triumphs of invention and discovery, as well as heartbreaking incidents of racism. <laughs> yep. Um, this past spring, we lost another incredible scholar, advocate, and friend in Dr. Paul Mullins. I met Dr. Mullins as a student way back in 2002 when I completed my first archaeology field school. The very first time I met him, I noticed that he had tan lines on his earlobes in the shape of the, uh, the, the bat signal. <laughs> you guys all know what I'm talking about with Batman. Um, so I knew he was going to be a really interesting person to know, and he was. He was brilliant and feisty and irreverently funny, like all the best people are. And in the 20 plus years since that summer field school, I felt honored to consider him not just a professor, but a colleague. He studied the past, not merely for the sake of writing about it, but to serve the community, to shed light on the present, and to advocate for justice. So today we also remember Paul, and I have a special video to share with you from Paul's longtime collaborator, Jordan Ryan. Jordan is an architectural historian and archivist currently working on built environment, land use, and other site-specific projects under the independent consulting firm, The History Concierge. 
Some of their ongoing projects include reference and archiving for the City of Indianapolis's Department of Metropolitan Development and facilitating oral histories and research for our NEH-funded Voices from Central State Memory Project here at the Indiana Medical History Museum. Ryan collaborated closely with Dr. Paul Mullins for seven years on projects related to spatial equity, heritage erasure, and disinvestment, including places like Indiana Avenue, IUPUI's campus, Norwood, the Interloop Highway System, and the Central State Hospital Cemeteries. Jordan's also been, uh, I should say, a great friend of the museum and, uh, and of me personally for many years. And so I want to thank them for taking the time to, to help us pay tribute to Paul. Good evening. My name is Jordan Ryan, and I'm honored to give a brief tribute to Dr. Paul Mullins. Paul was my main collaborator for almost a decade. He was a force larger than life, producing a monumental amount of scholarship while teaching, mentoring students, and staying engaged with numerous communities. Dr. Mullins was a historical archaeologist who studied urban displacement and erasure, spatial equity, materiality, and the color line in Indianapolis. Paul's passing this year is such a loss to Indianapolis, but he lives on through his work, particularly through his publicly accessible materials like his archaeology and material culture blog, the Invisible Indianapolis blog, his Encyclopedia of Indianapolis entries, his numerous recorded programs, his articles shared on scholar works and on his website and through so many of his colleagues and students who will continue this work. So now I will read an excerpt from one of his pieces. Uh, this piece is called The Heritage of Racism in Medicine in Indianapolis, and it's available on his Invisible Indianapolis blog. In May 1908, the Indiana University School of Medicine graduated its first class, including Clarence Augustus Lucas. Lucas had come to Indianapolis in 1904 to study at the Central College of Physicians and Surgeons before he completed three years at the Medical College of Indiana, a Purdue University-affiliated medical school that was absorbed by Indiana University in April of 1908. Lucas graduated in May 1908 and is today considered the first African-American graduate of the Indiana University School of Medicine. Nevertheless, his history is punctuated by a persistent structural racism and personal dehumanization that illuminates the ways racism has been embedded in medical training and African-American healthcare since emancipation. Clarence Lucas's story is not simply a historical artifact. Instead, it is consequential today because the heritage of race, medical training, and public health care in Indianapolis profoundly shapes the contemporary experiences of health care across the color line. Most African Americans' medical care that would today warrant hospitalization was administered at home well into the 20th century. Family members, midwives, alternative medicine practitioners, and root doctors treated African Americans alongside a small circle of licensed medical doctors. Indianapolis's city hospital admitted Black patients and reserved a modest number of beds for Black patients, but no Black physicians could attend to patients in the hospital. There were several small Black hospitals. They had perhaps 50 beds between them. Joseph Ward graduated from the city's Physio Medical College in 1897 and then completed a degree at the Medical College in Indiana of Indiana in 1900, and he was admitting patients to his private ward sanitarium hospital by August 1906. An August 1909 description of the sanitarium indicated that he had 16 beds. In March 1912, Ward announced his plan to merge his hospital with the Sisters of Charity Hospital. Planning for the Sisters of Charity Hospital began in October 1909, and the hospital opened there in June 1911. The third hospital for African Americans was Lincoln Hospital, which was established in 1909 by a group of African American physicians whose board of managers included Clarence Lucas. The 20-bed hospital at 1101 North Senate Avenue could accommodate 17 patients, and its surgery had been outfitted with funding from Indianapolis Motor Speedway's co-founder, Carl Fisher. Nevertheless, the hospital would close in 1915. The three modest hospitals could hardly address the medical care for an expanding African-American community. So Clarence Lucas was born in Huntington, West Virginia in 1884, Lucas likely arrived in Indianapolis for his medical training in 1904, and in 1905, he was living at 427 West Vermont Street. In May 1908, Lucas graduated, and shortly afterward, he was part of a group of recently graduated physicians tested to assume six intern positions at City Hospital. 
On June 1st, the Indianapolis News confirmed that Lucas had secured one of the positions, reporting that much of interest, much interest of an unusual nature attaches to the list of city hospital interns, as it includes the name of a Negro, Dr. Clarence Lucas. Dr. Lucas took sixth place in the competitive examination. Lucas became just the second African-American intern at City Hospital, following Sumner Furness in 1894. When Furness reported to City Hospital in June 1894, the hospital superintendent reported that four patients had already entered their objections to being attended by a colored physician. Yet several prominent white physicians insisted Furness was qualified and should assume his intern position. And the Indianapolis Journal editorialized that the time has passed when an educated colored man who shows qualifications of a high order can be set aside for public duties because Negro blood courses his veins. If there are men or women in the hospital who feel they cannot serve, would Dr. Furness, because his skin is a little darker than theirs, they can resign. Despite such seemingly progressive sentiments, racial segregation increased in the early 20th century and just four African-American physicians interned at City Hospital between Lucas's appointment and 1917. Lawrence Lewis entered the IU School of Medicine in 1907, graduated in the class of 1911, and became an intern in April 1911. Lewis practiced in Indianapolis until his death in 1964. The other three had long medical careers but did not work in the Circle City. Albert Cleage, for example, graduated from the IU School of Medicine and became a city hospital intern in 1910 before moving to Michigan in 1914. Howard Thompson graduated from IU School of Medicine in June 1913, became a city hospital intern, and returned to practice in Evansville in 1914. After his entrance exams, William Gibbs was selected as a city hospital intern in 1917, but he was required to agree to eat with other Black employees in a segregated dining space and to treat only those colored patients who might be assigned to him. Gibbs initially accepted those terms, but resigned soon after. A group of African Americans met with the Board of Health, but Gibbs abandoned the effort and moved to Chicago in 1919 to pursue medicine. Aspiring African American medical students had increasingly fewer options for training in the 20th century. In 1910, the Flexner Report, influential study on medical education in the US and Canada, ensured the segregation of medical training. The author, Abraham Flexner, was enlisted to professionalize medical training visiting all 155 medical schools in operation in 1909. Flexner advocated reducing those 155 schools to just 31, and he championed the elimination of all but two African-American medical schools. So that decree would leave just Howard University Medical School and Mahari Medical College as institutions training a significant number of Black medical professionals. Those two institutions trained three quarters of the nation's Black doctors in the subsequent half century. The Flexner Report assumed Black physicians would exclusively treat Black patients in a segregated society, and Flexner voiced a commonplace white wariness of the public health dangers posed by African Americans. Contemporary community attitudes towards public health, the medical school, and the city's medical facilities are all shaped by that heritage, and serving the community today requires acknowledging that deep-seated histories of anti-Black racism inevitably shape present-day experiences of healthcare. Recognizing this history acknowledges institutional complicity in racism and admits that heritage shapes contemporary experience. Again, the full text is available on Invisible Indianapolis. Paul was my everything, but somehow we have to pick up the pieces where we left off with the scholarship. I'd like to think that Leon's work is a huge part of that, and I'm excited to see where Leon's work takes him. Thank you for your time. Now we'll begin our program, Medical Care in Indianapolis During the Age of Jim Crow. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Leon E. Bates. Leon Bates is a U.S. historian of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, the end of Reconstruction to the Great Depression, 1876 to 1929. His research focus is the urban environment with interests in education, housing, infrastructure, labor, medicine, policing, violence, police violence, and the intersection of race. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Africana Studies and History from Indiana University, Purdue University of Indianapolis. What are we supposed to call that now? Like all of our degrees, are we supposed to say something else now? <laughs> uh, IU Indy. Um, 
and he has a Master of Arts in Pan-African Studies from the University of Louisville and a Master of Arts in History from Wayne State University with a graduate certificate in archival administration. Currently, he's a PhD student in the Department of Pan-African African Studies at the University of Louisville. Thank you very much, Leon, for being here to share your expertise with us. Uh, I'm very excited to hear what you have to tell us, so I'm going to just turn things over to you. Man, no pressure to that. Okay, um, now I'll try not to embarrass the family. Um, if you're not amazed when I get to the end of this story, uh, I failed. Because when I discovered this man many years ago, I had no idea the impact he had on medicine in the city of Indianapolis, uh, the US Army, I just, I was amazed. And with that said, let's get started. Um, medical care in Indianapolis, we're gonna answer Jim Crow. We have to also look outside of Indianapolis. We have to look at the United States as a whole, and we have to look at Indianapolis to really get an understanding of this. So I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth a little bit between these two. And some of the slides we won't spend a lot of time on, probably most of them. This is one of the most, um, I don't know, impressive quotes I've ever seen that I think we really need to think about. Those who cannot remember the past are gonna be condemned to repeat it. Um, and that doesn't just mean medicine. A few of the events I want you to think about and get in your mind as we're going through this is Dred Scott versus J.A. Sanford, 1857. Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. Buck v. Bell. In Buck v. Bell, that is the Supreme Court decision in 1927 that allows the state to forcibly, against your will, sterilize you. Indiana participated in that. The Hilburton Act, 1946, is a federal law that actually gives money to hospitals and medical facilities in 1946 and begins to break down racial segregation in hospitals. Um, I said, that doesn't happen until 1946. Yeah. There are people still among us who remember that. Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. It's going to become important in a little bit. Most of us know about that. Simpkins versus um, Moses Cone Hospital, 1963, is a federal court decision that, again, breaks down the barriers and racial segregation in medicine. The Indiana ed Anatomical Education Law. Most no one's heard of this. This law in Indiana allowed anyone who died in the custody of a prison, a county jail, a mental hospital, um, any public facility, if you died and your family did not claim your body, it would be turned over to medical science. No questions asked. If your family didn't show up and claim you, you were off to what they call the pickling vat and then to the medical school. Indiana eugenics law, um, predates the um, Buck v. Bell decision in 1927 by almost 20 years. And then I threw this one there for people to understand. Henry Hellcat Thomas, most of you have never heard of him. Thomas shot a policeman in Indianapolis and was killed. Even though his family knew where he was and was going to claim his body, Marion County sent him to the anatomical board and his body was dissected as a medical experiment. So it did happen some names that you probably ought to leave here with. Samuel Cartwright, we're gonna talk about him. J. Marion Sims, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> Thomas J. Perrin, most of you have never heard of him. We're gonna talk about him in a minute, Eugene Dibble. Samuel Elbert was the first African-American doctor known to be in Indianapolis. Joseph Alexander, another fine gentleman. He's a white doctor with Indianapolis. And he was a part, he's a, one of the reasons that we now have, and we still live under that 1907 anatomical law. Um, he was a part of a body snatching, a body stealing ring. He was the white doctor buying, the, at least accused of, he was never convicted, of buying the bodies that were being stolen. Paul F. Robinson, Marion County Coroner, medical doctor, part of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he has a very shady reputation. And of course, the one we're gonna talk about, Joseph Ward. 
Most of you remember when Eskenazi Hospital opened in 2013, and Eskenazi Hospital has many great assets about it. It's the only burn center in Indiana. It is a level one trauma center, and there are four of those in Indianapolis. It's a transplant center, and there are four of those in Indianapolis. And it a, uh, has a mental, a mental ward or, or mental health uh, apparatus. Eskenazi has been through many iterations. Today it's Eskenazi before it was Wishart, Marion County General, Indianapolis General, Indianapolis City Hospital, U.S. Army General Hospital. Most people don't realize that, that hospital was taken over by the U.S. government in, during the Civil War and expanded greatly. And then it was turned back over to the city after the war and continued on. There are other hospitals you need to have a little bit of an understanding associated with that. The Indianapolis Flower Mission, most of us probably heard of the Bellflower Clinic. Okay, well, that is all a part of that history. But it, at one time was a hospital and they mainly treated TB patients. Robert W. Long Hospital closed in the 1970s. The building is still there. Uh, we'll talk about that. Sunnyside Sanitarium, uh, that was a TB hospital in Indianapolis up until we finally figured out how to deal with TB and now the hospital was closed because we didn't need it anymore. James Wick and Riley, still there. Um, started as a children's hospital in 1924. Coleman Hospital has been closed for a number of years. It was a women's hospital and university hospital. The Coleman building is still there. University Hospital is still there today. It replaced Long Hospital. I learned about Dr. Ward when I was actually researching this man when I was an undergrad at IUPUI. And he's the first African-American policeman killed in Indianapolis and probably the state of Indiana in 1922. But Dr. Ward actually treated him. He was shot in June and he lived in November, which is kind of amazing. In 1922, they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have microsurgery. They didn't have a lot of things. And this man lived where most people died within a day or two. He lived for almost six months before he finally succumbed to his wounds. And he died at Ward Sanitarium. I never heard of Ward Sanitarium. It took me several years to unravel the story behind Ward Sanitarium. And I knew Dr. Ward was a different man when I was at Cranville Cemetery and I found this grave marker. And if you look carefully, it's kind of hard to see because the stone is now uh, stained. But in that third line, it says LT space COL space MC dash reserves, Lieutenant Colonel Medical Corps reserves. And it just kind of stopped me in my tracks because I knew what that meant. African-American, number one, he's a World War I veteran. He's a medical doctor. I did not know they had black medical doctors in World War I. I didn't know there was one from Indianapolis that had risen to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. So I knew this man was gonna be different but no one knew who this Sam Hill he was when I first started. So digging back into his, his past, he got his medical license in 1897, excuse me. And I found this at the State Archives, and it's a copy of the uh, page of the book where this is what you got for a license in 1897. They wrote all this up and then gave him a receipt for what he paid, and that's how it was recorded. This is Dr. Ward himself. That's a picture of him as a young man, probably about the time he got his medical license. And the picture was taken in Washington, D.C., I do believe. Dr. Ward was born in Wilson, North Carolina, and then somehow he got to Washington, D.C. at about age 16, 17 years old. While he was there, he encounters a man from Indianapolis, a doctor named George Hasty. And Hasty is the one who actually uh, brings Dr. Ward back to Indianapolis. And I have no idea why he did that. There's no records that tell why he took this young man who was a um, first generation freedman. He was born in the same slave cabin that his mother was born in. His maternal grandfather owned his mother and his grandmother. It's hard to think about that for a minute, but. This man is the first generation freedman and he's gonna to rise to do things I'm gonna tell you about here shortly. And why, um, why he took an interest in it is beyond me. One of the things that we're gonna talk about is what Margaret Washington in her book calls medical apartheid. And what she's describing is how medicine was practiced in the United States in the 19th and 20th century, what it looked like and how African-Americans were treated. African-Americans were treated very differently. Another one we are going to talk about in this, uh, even though Dr. Ward is briefly mentioned in this book, 
it talks about a concept, an idea. One of them is the black hospital movement. At one time, there were more than 120 black hospitals in the United States. Um, and there were the medical schools that Jordan mentioned in her, uh, her presentation. After the flash report is released, as Jordan said, two black medical schools were left. Samuel Cartwright. Samuel Cartwright was a medical doctor. He got his degree from Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. And one of the things that about him that just stick with me is Samuel Cartwright came up with a medical diagnosis of why African-Americans fled enslavement and resisted enslavement, called it dreptomania. Published an article about this. Most people have never heard about. In that article near the end, he talks about the way to cure dryptomania is to just whip the hell out of them or whip the devil out of them, I think he says. That's his solution, how you handle African-Americans who resist or who run away. This man, his name was Gordon, later described as Peter. If you look at his back, it is severely scarred. This is an example of what um, Cartwright was talking about. This is how you cure dryptomania, medical doctor. J. Marion Sims, if you have not heard about J. Marion Sims, J. Marion Sims was a medical doctor, got his degree from Jefferson Medical College. Sims perfected, please forgive me, I'm not a medical person. He perfected a treatment for the visio vesula fistula. It's a long word that basically means that there is an opening that should not be there, typically between the bladder and the vagina, the birth canal. This happens in prolonged struggling labor, especially for smaller women, younger women. Um, and when it happens, the tissues in these two particular organs will tear. And sometimes when they heal, they heal together, leaving an opening so that urine continually leaks from the vagina. And up until till Sims, there was not a cure or a repair for this. Sims perfects it. He perfects it on enslaved women. This image, and it's out of the way, Park Davis had this image years ago, and now it's on the internet. They refuse to share it for a long time. If you look at it, the man on the right, of course, is Sims, and he's holding a speculum in his hand. There's a black woman there who's unknown, one of his victims. There are two other doctors he's gonna demonstrate some type of procedure on. And you see the two women who are peeking around the sheep. Those two women, along with other women, would hold the woman down who's being examined or being worked on. And he would do the repair to this sensitive part of the body without anesthetic. He would cut and suture the female genitalia. And he did it repeatedly to some of them. And they had no recourse. They could not refuse. They could not... Um, they just had to lay there and take it, and take it without any anesthetic. Once he perfected this, he moved from Alabama, where this is done, to New York City, opens up a, a clinic or a hospital, if you will, performs the same procedure on white women with anesthetic. But he perfected it on black women. Thomas Parent. Thomas Parent oversaw the Tuskegee experiments from 1932 to 1972. The United States government paid for a syphilis study to see what would happen if syphilis was untreated in men. All the men they were doing this on were African-Americans, none of them. Today we talk about informed consent. No such thing. They didn't tell them what they were doing or why. They just did it. At some point, they took this same crazy idea to Guatemala and tried it again. Perrin goes on to a successful career. He leaves the Tuskegee program in the hands of Eugene Dibble. Dibble was a doctor at the, uh, the name escapes me. There's a medical hospital, it's still, the building is still there in Tuskegee on the campus of Tuskegee University. John Andrew Hospital, that's where Dibble was. And Dibble becomes like the local black expert on this study and stays with it for many years. When uh, Perrin leaves, Dibble takes over. 
Medical exp experimentation went on in Indiana as well. And I mentioned earlier, I think Jordan touched on this, body snatching, grave robbing, that went on here in Indianapolis. It became such a scandal, such a problem that Rufus Cantrell was actually in prison for this. And the newspapers called him the king of the ghouls. Cantrell was so good that when he went out to take a fresh body out of the ground, he didn't dig the whole grave up. He only dug up a part of it and used a couple of hooks to stick down and get the people by the shoulders and pull them right up out of there and then cover it back up. And Cantrell sold the bodies to the medical schools. And this is all before the Flexner, the Flexner report and how things started to change and scientific medicine started taking over. This was back in the good old days where there were no rules, no regulations, and black graves were raided constantly. One of the things they talked about was the pickling vat. An Indianapolis man who killed a policeman in 1906, the newspapers talked about he was headed to the pickling vat because he was going to be executed in Michigan City, and his family had no way of actually claiming his body and bringing him back to Indianapolis. And the black mortician, um, Cassius M.C. Willis, many of you have heard of Willis Funeral Home. Willis came up with the idea that he contacted the state prison and had Williams embalmed and sent back to him. And once he got him back here, he dressed and prepared him for viewing. And he put on his chest a small can. And on that can, there was a card that asked people to donate to cover the expenses for the family. And by the time they had the funeral, a day or two later, they had all the money they needed to pay for all the expenses. And that saved George Williams from going to the pickling vat. But had it not been for someone else in the black community, he would have ended up in a medical experiment. Indianapolis City Hospital. This is the, what the city hospital looked like. And if you look to the left of that image, you see what appears to be a white extension. That's what the U.S. Army built onto the back of that building. And actually, this that's on one side. There's another one on the other side, just as big. And that's what City Hospital looked like when Indianapolis took it back over. This is in the 1880s, the same building. And if you look at the, uh, where is it? this part right here, that is what's existing. Those two wings have been torn off and permanent wings have been added to it. That building sat on the IEPUI campus about where the Wilson Street garage now stands. And here is their amphitheater in the old building. Looks a lot like this room. You look around. And here is uh, Dr. Wisher demonstrating something. But what's interesting, if you look real careful, you probably can't see it very well. There is an African American right there. I'm not sure who he is but there is one there in the 1880s. So even though medical treatment is segregated in the Indianapolis, there was still some interaction in why and who the, why he's there and who he is, I don't know. This is what a surgery room would have looked like at that time. Here's a treatment area, probably one of the clinics, and it's African-American men being treated for some type of injury to his arm. I'm not sure who she is, but the lady in black, I imagine it's probably some type of, uh, at that time, a social worker or social something to do, dealing with the finances, paying for this. This is what the men's ward looked like. I'm going to show you another picture in a second to explain why it looks like this. And just look at the floors, the walls, even the wallpaper's peeling. Take a good look at that. This is what on the back of the image when you find it, it's called the incurables ward in the pest house, shorthand for a, a TB hospital at the time, some type of incurable disease. Look how crowded it is, how close those beds are. You have men, you have boys, you have what appears to be at least one if not two white girls in there. They may be like complexed African-Americans, I don't know. But if you look carefully, there, that's the joints work on the floor above. This window is a basement window and a window window. Looks very different from the image before when you look at this. These are all white men. And if you look at that, there's a door going out. There's light coming through from the outside. 
Medical treatment was very different. After the Flexner Report comes out in 1908, or 1910, excuse me, Indiana, Indiana in 1908 started, they knew this was coming and started making changes and preparing for this. And this is still the, uh, uh, that's Charles Emerson Hall over at IUPUI, the home of the IU Medical School. They took the classrooms out many years ago and put them in the Med Science Building. So most of this building now is just administrative for the medical school, but that's their home. That's Robert Long Hospital over on Michigan Street. The building is still there. Robert Long Hospital was built in 1914, or opened in 1914. The interesting thing about that is until Robert Long Hospital opened, one of the things the Flexner Report required was medical doctors to have, um, to have clinical training. IU did not have a hospital to do clinical training. So they had to use City Hospital, Wisher, Eskenazi. That's where they got their training until they built Long. Once they built Long, and they could kind of separate. But IU and Indianapolis, Marion County have never totally separated. They still do a lot of work together. Long, even though the state law didn't require it, was segregated. No sooner they got that place open, an African-American lady from Greencastle tried to be admitted for some type of surgery she needed. She had all the paperwork. The county medical officer had signed off on it to give her a certificate to be admitted to Long, and then she gets to Long and they turn her away. Then there's a big controversy. Eventually she's taken over to Wisher and she's treated and Wisher gets her surgery and she goes on about her business. But this is how medical care went on in Indiana. The Flanner House, most people probably heard of the Flanner House. Flanner House starts in the 1890s as much of a settlement house movement where they're actually trying to help people coming into the city, mainly African-Americans who need everything, clothes, food, how to can food, you name it. This is what they were doing. And it was mainly funded by Frank Flanner, who was the founder of Flanner Buchanan Mortuaries. This building is a house just a couple of blocks away from where Long Hospital stands today. Bethel AME Church. What a lot of people don't know in this city is that when there was mass sickness in the city of Indianapolis, Bethel AME Church and Second Baptist Church, these two buildings still stand. They set up beds in the basement of the church, and the women of the church did nursing duties, prepared, prepared meals, and the black doctors in the community took turns going to the, to the churches, to the basement, to see over these people to make sure they were treated. That's what black medical care looked like until 1946. Short of that building is still there, so just west of the university. And this one is within a block, just south of it. There, neither one is a church today, but those buildings for many, many years, for decades, served every time there was an outbreak of mass sickness, they sprang into action. The Lincoln Hospital that uh, Jordan spoke of, that used to be at 11th and Capitol Avenue, 11th Senate. That was felt it was needed and the doctors themselves tried to get the hospital off the ground and deal with it. But the biggest part of the problem was financing, funding, and that's why it failed. The Sisters of Charity Hospital, another organization, a little bit more longer lived, but at the same time, it, su it suffered from funding problems. And this was just one of the many homes of Sisters of Charity. This one was at 15th and Senate, I believe it was, or Missouri Street, excuse me. And eventually it ended up on the IUPUI campus where the parking garage is now across from the uh, informatics building, informatics and journalism there at Michigan Street. Ward Sanitarium. This one was one of several, but this one is um, his 1904 Installation. This is a house that's long gone. It was across from the Walker Theater. Uh, it's been torn down decades ago. It's now a parking lot for IEPUI. Dr. Ward opened that in, the, in 1904. In November 1904, he and his wife got married. And they had a big celebration up and down Indiana Avenue with several of the more prominent families and businesses. And it stayed there until after World War I. Sumner Furnace got mentioned. 
One of the things you look at this photograph that impressed me is look at all the instruments in that glass case beside him. He's got all the instruments and other things he needs, or at least most of them, to be a practicing physician, but yet he's not allowed to practice medicine at City Hospital or at any of the other private hospitals. At the time, there was Methodist Hospital, St. Vincent, St. Francis. They all existed, but they either refused or took very few Black patients. This is the image inside the Flanner House, and that's Dr. Henry Hummins examining a kid, and that's either a sister or a mom there with the nurse. In 1926, I think it was, 26, 28, there was a grand idea to create a Black hospital, a Negro hospital in Indianapolis, 300-bed hospital. Not that it wasn't needed, it didn't happen because the Great Depression comes along in 1929 and this plan gets squashed, but there was a whole plan. Uh, and there is a book in the IPY library, I think what the city library, if it still hasn't fallen apart, that you can actually read where they were planning for this in the 1920s. This is some of the black hospitals that we're talking about. Provident Hospital, Sisters of Charity, Lincoln Hospital, Ward Sanitarium, and I included Bethel AME, Second Baptist Church of Flanner House, all part of the black community and what medical what medical treatment looked like. And then some of the people that were involved in it. Melinda Thomas was not a medical professional. What she was was a member of Bethel AME Church, and she was a fundraiser. She kept Sisters of Charity going for many years. Some of their first courses, the doctor, Joseph Ward, Lawrence Lewis. Henry Hummins, we talked about them. They're all medical doctors, most of them trained in Indiana. I just talked about that again, a 300 bed hospital. And one of the things they were gonna do again is provide a place for uh, hands-on um, clinical training that was sorely needed. Ended Joseph Ward more this gets interesting about him. Joseph Ward, when World War I starts, or let me back up, when the United States enters in April 1917, Joseph Ward is 45 years old, has two children and a thriving medical practice that he closes. He joins the army. He is the oldest of the 106 African-American doctors that go to France. He becomes the first African-American to lead a U.S. Army field hospital. He becomes the first African-American to lead a veterans hospital. He becomes the first African-American to lead any major hospital in the United States. He's from Indiana, and we don't even know who the Sam Hill he is. Now, we got all kind of names over there at IUPUI on that campus of people that were in medicine, but nobody over there knows who this guy was. He goes to France, becomes, he's already a surgeon, but he goes to France and he becomes one of the first and best trauma surgeons in the United States. There in France on the front lines. This is a ship he goes overseas on. This is an image of it, I found it fascinating. My daughter actually found that one day and sent it to me. It's the US or USS Orizaba where he was taken to France and this is the, he was with the 92nd Division. There were two African American divisions in the First World War, the 92nd and 93rd. Most people have heard of the Buffalo Soldiers, which technically becomes the 92nd Division. I'll show you why in a second. And most of them have heard of the 369th Infantry Regiment, the Harlem Hellfighters, but that's only a part of a much larger group. What most people don't realize is those soldiers fought under French command, not American command. When they got to France, the United States parceled all of them off to France. The 92nd fought as the division. The 93rd fought as separate regiments in the French army. So they fought under the French flag. The 92nd division lost 120 men killed and 1,500 wounded. 93rd, 467 killed and 3,000 wounded. Here's an image of Joseph Ward on his way home on the left. And he's a, the rank of major. He was promoted in France. And let me back up just a second. When any time a medical doctor or a lawyer goes into the military, once they complete their basic training, 
they're automatically promoted to captain, except the African Americans during the First World War. Dr. Ward and his counterparts were all made first lieutenants because they were African American. In Dr. Ward's records, I found where one of the white trainers at Camp Des Moines, Iowa, wrote that he should be promoted. They noticed his ability as a leader, and as a surgeon, and, and a doctor, that he was really good. He was something different. Keep your eye on this guy. The image on the left is after the war is over, he's back in the United States, and he gets hired by the federal government to run the Tuskegee VA Hospital, which is at the time was VA Hospital number 91 in Tuskegee, Alabama. Typically, when you got that job, they automatically made you a colonel in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, unless you're black, and they made you a lieutenant colonel. So even though he's running a hospital and he's the first black man to do it, they made him a lieutenant colonel. Now, what makes Tuskegee VA so much different from all the other VA hospitals is that it was ex exclusively African-American. And what I mean is there were 300,000 veterans of the first world, African-American veterans of the first world war. And of those 300,000 veterans, if you got sick and you needed medical treatment, you had to go to Tuskegee, Alabama if you were black. There were 90 other hospitals across the country and you could not go to any of them. You had to get on the train and go all the way to Tuskegee, Alabama. The NAACP, the Urban League and other groups were railing against the federal government's plan to actually put a white doctor in charge of it. And through that protest and raising noise, raising cane, they settled on a black doctor who some of the people in the army knew of from the First World War, Joseph Ward. They hired him to be the first medical director. And one of the things Ward does is Ward, this is him coming home from France. This is one of the patients, one of the men who's injured. If you look at it carefully, you see his right leg below the knee is missing. I have to think that potentially had Ward and his, his uh, colleagues not been there, the man may not have survived at all. They couldn't save his leg, but they saved his life. And when that man needed treatment or needed that leg adjusted or whatever, he had to leave. This is in New York City. He had to get on a train and go from New York City to Tuskegee, Alabama. There again is Dr. Ward in his, after even promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. This is the image of Tuskegee VA Hospital. And that's what it looks like. You're looking north and to the left, is the Tuskegee University. To the right off the screen and further away, about a mile or so, is the uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield, where the Tuskegee Airmen train. All this is happening all in the same spot down there. This is the image I'm looking for. If you look at that image, this is the administrative staff of VA Hospital Number 91, later Tuskegee VA Hospital. They're all African-Americans. Every last one of them, the nurses, the dietitians, the psychiatrists, all are African-American. And people said this could not be done. It would not work. One of the interesting things about this is in Alabama, they passed a law making it illegal for a white nurse to attend an African-American patient, especially an African-American male. When they decided to open this hospital in Tuskegee, Alabama, Immediately, they knew a lot of good paying federal jobs were coming, and they wanted the white nurses to have it. But the state law said they couldn't attend these black men. Dr. Ward wants to hire black nurses. They suggested that we'll hire white nurses and black nurses' aides so the white nurses can tell these black nurses' aides what to do. Dr. Ward wouldn't agree. And two of those women in that photo, I'm not sure which one of the two they are. They are charge nurses, head nurses. Those black women went to Alabama and showed that they could actually run that hospital. The one of them is the dietitian, And this really upsets the locals in Alabama when she goes out and starts making deals with the local farmers that she will buy their produce at market rate to supply the hospital, which every other VA hospital was doing at the time. 
the locals wanted her to buy from the white co-op and she said no. She bought straight direct from these people. That truly irritated the locals in Alabama and that's what it eventually gets Dr. Ward in trouble. But for several years, every year they had their annual inspection, everything passes. One of those men, I think he's on the far left, was not a medical professional. He was a logistics guy. He got out of Harvard, excuse me, out of Howard University to run the purchasing in the, uh, the logistics operation at the hospital. They did everything almost perfectly. Again, the Hill Burton Act helps to desegregate hospitals. Executive order in 9981 is the, the executive order in 1948. Harry Truman signed to desegregate the United States military. It also desegregates the veterans hospitals. Dr. Ward leaves Tuskegee in 1936. Brown versus Board of Education is in 1954 and Simpkins v. Cone is 1963. Dr. Ward starts practicing medicine in 1897. Plessy versus Ferguson is, is decided in 1896. He dies in 1950, 1956, 50, 1956, no, 1955. But Brown versus Board is decided in 1954. So his entire career is bookmarked by Jim Crow. In the middle of Jim Crow, he does all the things I'm talking about now. If I can do half of that, before I leave here, I will have accomplished something. And this is a historical marker that I and some others got put up for Dr. Ward near where his last and biggest, uh, his biggest hospital sanitarium stood. The state of Indiana agreed to do that in 2019. This is Lincoln Hospital's marker. Um, Norma got this one done. I think in 2017, 2018? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was a lot of work. If you see the information we had to submit on those two, it's a lot of information that we really had to justify that these things should have been, been marked. Sisters of Charity is not done yet. <laughs> I know someone who's working on it and I've helped her with it and hopefully it will get done. And then those three Black hospital, the, the Provident Hospital, the first one, was not very long lived, only a few months, and we can't find information on it. We just know that it existed. We can't even figure out where it existed at. I included this picture because if you look at this picture for a moment, that's Dr. Ward and his wife, Zella. That was probably taken in the late 1940s. Dr. Ward could not have gotten where he was without the assistance help and support of his wife. There's just no way in H-E-L-L -L that would have happened. He's off in France fighting the First World War and their son, nine years old, dies in the flu pandemic. And his wife and daughter, who was, I think, eight at the time, had to deal with that and bury that child. He was overseas. He wasn't here to stand with her to support her. But she supported what he was doing. I don't know a lot about her, except to tell you that her family for three or four generations before her were already in Indianapolis. She marries that man and she dies in December of 1954, 50 years and one month after they were married. She drove home, got somewhere to a social event, got all the way back to the house and they believe had a medical emergency, probably a heart attack, but she had got the car parked and they had a Lincoln that had electric windows on it. And rather than let the windows up, she let the windows down and she passes out in the car and he finds her the next morning. She sat in the car in December of 1954 after having a medical emergency and she's not found the next day. And she dies at Indianapolis City Hospital or General Hospital, maybe it was by the time this happens. And that is the end of their relationship. And that woman made him or helped to make him who and what he was. So I included this picture. Um, this is some of the other reading you can do about what I've been talking about here. And I've been going through this really fast. So um, please you know, forgive me. But Norma Erickson has a great 
MA thesis that's very helpful. I suggest you read it. It will help you understand what we're talking about. William Marsh, his, uh, his report, which I think the uh, Community Foundation of Indianapolis paid for in the 1920s is in the library. You can get a copy. You can't get a copy, but you can read it. It's so old and weather beaten that they won't let you take it out of the building. Um, Thomas Hager's The Demon Under the Microscope will help you understand what scientific medicine starts to look like after the First World War or about that time period. Vanessa Northington Gamble, you saw a cover of that book, Making a Place of Our Own. She, Vanessa Northington Gamble is a medical doctor, but she has a PhD and she wrote a book about what medicine for black people looked like and talks about the hospital and hospital care. Harriet Washington's Medical Apartheid really gets down into what was going on. And she explores, she's one of the people who explores uh, J. Marion Sims and what he did. Stephen Ortiz writes a book on uh, veteran policies about hospitalization. And Doug, uh, Douglas Frazier in Joanne Buckley's book on African-American doctors talks about all the doc all the black doctors in World War I. For anybody that thinks being a medical doctor was easy, piece of cake, one of his colleagues, Dr. Urban Bass, was killed in an aid station treating other injured soldiers when a shell goes off near him and almost, almost amputates both legs. And he was giving instructions to the medics on how to actually put tranquils, tourniquets, thank you, tourniquets on both his legs to stop the bleeding and then get him moved back to the field hospital. He died on the way to the field hospital. Darling Clark Hines has a great book on uh, black women as nurses. When the 92nd and 93rd went to France, they went without nurses. Every other unit, every other division of the US Army that went to France took nurses, except the 92nd and 93rd, because the Army wouldn't take black nurses. And near the end of the war, they had started training a couple at Fort Dix, New Jersey, but the war ends before they actually can be fully commissioned as nurses and sent overseas. If you want to know what 19th century medicine looked like, for those who haven't seen it, this, this series on TV is pretty damn close. Um, they use a lot of the instruments to make that show. Uh, and growing up, my mom went to nursing school over at General Hospital. I should have told you that. So I heard her talk about some of these things from the 1950s and 60s. And I'm watching this and like, that's what she was talking about. She gave these vivid descriptions of like what an iron lung looked like. And as a young electrician, I actually saw one in the basement of Riley Hospital, pushed back in the corner in the basement. And I knew what it was because of her description. It was an iron lung. For those who don't know what that was, if you had polio and it was bad enough, they put you in this thing and they had a motor that operated a bellows that kept your lungs functioning so you could breathe. If that thing stopped, you couldn't breathe because you couldn't breathe on your own. At the end of it was a large chrome-plated handle that if there was a power failure, the nurses had to operate this handle. And it was so much work that the nurses knew who was in one and where it was, and they knew they had to run there and relay back and forth to keep the thing going. Because one nurse would pass out after about 20 minutes, half hour doing this, she's going to collapse. So they had to have more than one. But if you want to see what it looks like from home, that's a good series. All right. I have bent your ears unmercifully. Um, as I said, I'm impressed by this man, but I wanted to get as much of this through as I could. Uh, hopefully you have some questions. I haven't bored you to tears. <laughs>